Illinois Business Hall of Fame presents Eugene McDonald, founder of the Zenith Radio Corporation. The career of Eugene McDonald Jr. illustrates the power of a properly conceived business purpose. McDonald was co-founder of the Zenith Radio Corporation. Early in the history of the company, he defined the purpose of Zenith so effectively that his definition guided Zenith's growth for the next 50 years. McDonald himself died in 1958, but his business purpose was so right for Zenith that it continued to guide the firm through 1978. It was a remarkable accomplishment by a remarkable man. Born in Syracuse, New York in 1888, Eugene McDonald enlisted in the United States Navy in 1917. He rose to the rank of lieutenant commander, and upon returning to civilian life at the end of the war, he remained active in the Navy as a reserve officer. Yachting became a major hobby, and among civilian friends, he came to be known as Commander McDonald, or simply the Commander. McDonald returned to Chicago, where he had operated a small business prior to the war. There he became interested in the fledgling radio industry. He decided to associate himself with the Chicago Radio Laboratory, which was housed in this facility. The Chicago Radio Laboratory was owned by R.H.G. Matthews and Carl Hassel. The two men operated an amateur radio station and manufactured radio sets with the brand named Zenith. In 1920, they were producing one set per week. The terms of McDonald's association with Matthews and Hassel called for him to provide funds for expansion and to serve as the firm's general manager. His partners were to continue to direct manufacturing activities. Within a few years, the firm's name was changed to the Zenith Radio Corporation. The early years at Zenith were marked by numerous pioneering developments. In 1922, the company constructed a transmitter and began broadcasting radio programs as station WJAZ. The following year, McDonald helped to organize the National Association of Broadcasters and became the first president of that organization. Here we see McDonald and his co-founders with the congratulatory letters and telegrams sent to them on the occasion of their organizational meeting. In 1923, Zenith introduced the first portable radio. It sold at retail for $200. Ten years later, Zenith had cut production costs to the point where portable radios were being profitably sold for $19.95. Beginning in 1923, McDonald launched an effort to sell the United States Navy on the idea of using shortwave radio for communications. The sales effort culminated in 1925 when McDonald persuaded the Navy to install Zenith shortwave equipment on two separate expeditions going to the northern and southern hemispheres. When the two expeditions were half a world apart, McDonald, who commanded one of the ships on the northern expedition, used shortwave equipment to enter into radio contact with the southern fleet. Here we see him with the group of Eskimos who took part in that historic broadcast. There were other proud firsts for Zenith, including this receiver, which was the first commercial set to operate on household electricity instead of batteries, and this radio receiver with an automatic tuning feature. By 1925, McDonald had also developed the business strategy that was to guide Zenith for the next five decades. The basic strategy was to aim for the high-quality, high-priced segment of the market and to communicate this emphasis on quality by such means as a strictly enforced quality control program and advertising themes such as the now famous phrase, the quality goes in before the name goes on. The quality control program was rigidly enforced at the factory level by a final inspection department whose head reported directly to McDonald. The importance of this organizational approach was once explained by McDonald when he said, quote, I create the standard. The inspection department maintains it. No matter how much we demand increased production from the factory, 
the inspection department rejects apparatus and refuses the stamp of approval until it has received the stamp of approval, unquote. McDonald saw this policy as a tool with which to build a special relationship with the consumer. As he once explained this to an irate distributor who wanted more Zenith products to sell, quote, to an opportunist, the temptation would be strong to push up production rapidly, slight the quality, and get the money while the season is on. But we are not opportunists. We are not in this business for just the present. We are building a reputation. And it is our hope that we shall always be behind in our orders because of increased demand for quality products, end quote. In order for McDonald's strategy to work, it was necessary to maintain tight control of inventories. The man who was able to do this successfully for Zenith was Hugh Robertson, who joined the company in 1924. Robertson's management skills became critical when the Great Depression began in the fall of 1929. The Depression was especially hard on the radio manufacturing industry. The volume of sales dropped dramatically. Sharp price competition broke out and most of the firms in the industry reported losses for several years in a row. Zenith experienced five straight years of losses, but Robertson's tight financial controls and McDonald's determination to stay in business kept the company alive until profits returned in the 1934 fiscal year. Although survival was the number one concern at Zenith during the early Depression years, McDonald and Robertson never lost sight of longer-run considerations. In 1931, Zenith researchers were assigned the task of beginning development work on television receivers. In 1935, McDonald asked Zenith's engineers to find a practical device to transform wind energy into electricity and thereby enable people in isolated areas to power their radios. Within 24 hours, the engineers had discovered an Iowa firm already in the business. McDonald bought the Iowa firm, and Zenith became a supplier of wind-driven electricity generating units for more than one-half million isolated rural homes. Here we see development work on the product with an automobile being used in place of a wind tunnel. It was also during the 1930s that McDonald became interested in the potential of FM radio communications. The technology had been developed and demonstrated by Major E. H. Armstrong, and the Federal Communications Commission had set aside channels for the development of FM. But as late as 1940, there were very few FM broadcasting stations in the country, and none in the Midwest. Zenith changed this situation by going on the air with the company's own FM broadcasting station, W9XZR. The date was February 2nd, 1940, and the studio was the modest facility seen in this photo. FM continued to develop slowly, but McDonald insisted on continuing developmental efforts. Zenith became the leading manufacturer of FM and AM-FM receivers, and eventually had the satisfaction of seeing FM become a profitable business. <music> Commander McDonald's leadership took Zenith into an unexpected product area in 1940 when a decision was made to enter into the hearing aid business. Forbes magazine pithily explained the development as follows, quote, As the result of an automobile accident, McDonald had lost the hearing in one ear. When he set out to buy an aid one day in 1940, he found that he had to pay $150 to $200 for what was really only a small portion of a radio. Hell, he said, I can build a radio for $19. By golly, this must be some business. He put his engineers to work and in 1943 brought out a unit selling for $40. In ordering the establishment of a production line for the hearing aid, McDonald stipulated that several hundred deaf persons be hired and provided with the new sets. Many of those hired had been unemployed for years because of hearing deficiencies. It was also in this period that Zenith introduced this famous transoceanic radio. But during the war, Zenith turned its attention to production related to the war effort. When World War II ended, the team of McDonald and Robertson had guided Zenith to the number two position in the radio receiver industry. 
In first place was the Philco Company, which, in contrast with Zenith, emphasized the low price end of the market. But television, not radio, was the top priority issue in the industry after the war. Zenith's television research began in 1931 and led to the introduction of the experimental receivers in 1939. Then on February 2, 1939, Zenith went on the air with television broadcasting station W9XZV. This was the first broadcasting station in Chicago. It operated three nights a week for three hours and was used by Zenith and other Chicago area manufacturers to test their receiver designs. Despite this progress, Zenith did not offer television receivers for sale to the general public until 1948, a year later than most of the competitors. The reason for this delay was McDonald's quality strategy. He wanted to be sure that when Zenith finally did offer a product for sale, it would meet the quality standards with which Zenith wished to be identified. Zenith's slow start in black and white television gave the competition an initial edge, and as late as 1956, the company only ranked fifth or sixth in the industry with a 6% share of the market. But then McDonald's strategy began to pay off. Industry-wide sales of television receivers began to fall. Many manufacturers cut prices, and in order to make a profit at the lower prices, many manufacturers cut production costs and quality. Zenith stepped up its advertising, maintained quality, and avoided the need to lower prices by tightly controlling inventories. Zenith's timing was perfect. The industry had entered a period when sales were dominated by replacement purchases and by purchases of the household's second set. Quality was an important consideration in the customer's mind, and that was what Zenith offered. The result was that between 1956 and 1959, Zenith sales and profits expanded rapidly, and by 1959, Zenith had passed RCA to become the leading seller in the industry. Zenith's share of the market had risen from 6% to 18% in that short time. Contributing to Zenith's success during this period was the company's emphasis on conventional, handcrafted production methods. The competition was adopting printed circuits to replace the hand wiring used by everyone, including Zenith. But Zenith argued that printed circuits could cause problems with the operation of the receiver and made the sets difficult to repair. So Zenith retained the hand wiring approach. Customers and repairmen apparently agreed with Zenith. Zenith's successful black and white television strategy was to be repeated in the area of color television. Zenith engineers began work on color in 1940, and some color broadcasts were made on Zenith's broadcasting station as early as 1941. By 1944, Zenith was manufacturing color receivers for use in experimental work. Zenith's arch rival, RCA, began to sell color receivers to the public in the mid-1950s. But Zenith did not offer color sets to the public until 1961. The reason, of course, was McDonald's rigid adherence to the quality strategy. As he told his unhappy Zenith distributors at one meeting in 1954, quote, We at Zenith believe it is much better to do the research work in the laboratory than to experiment upon the public, unquote. When color receivers were introduced by Zenith, RCA had achieved a commanding lead in color sales. This lead, of course, was fully justified by RCA's pioneering efforts in commercializing color television. But history was about to be repeated. Slowly yet steadily, Zenith gained ground on the leader. By 1969, Zenith was within two percentage points of industry leader RCA's market share. And by 1973, Zenith had taken first place in sales away from RCA. Eugene McDonald did not live to witness Zenith's final triumph in color television. He died in 1958. He left behind a management team which continued to employ the traditional Zenith strategy. One member of that team, of course, was Hugh Robertson. Robertson had been with McDonald since 1924. He directed most of the daily operations of the firm throughout McDonald's long tenure as chief executive officer. 
And most old-time employees at Zenith give Robertson equal credit with McDonald as co-author of the firm's success story. Robertson himself was advanced in years, and a new team of younger executives was given the job of handling the daily affairs of Zenith. Two key members of the new generation were Joseph Wright, who became president, and Sam Kaplan, who, as executive vice president and treasurer, assumed the financial roles previously handled by Robertson. That's Kaplan on the right and Joe Wright standing. Not all of Eugene McDonald's ideas worked out successfully. One of several which did not was phone vision. This was to be a system of subscription television which would allow viewers to pay for programs they wanted to watch. Here is how it worked. A phone vision test subscriber calls the phone vision operator and requests the key or clearing signal. This is sent from the transmitter over the telephone line into the subscriber's home and through a filter into the television receiver. The phone vision decoder then clears up the scrambled picture. Before the special coding signal was sent, the picture on the viewer's screen would look like this. As soon as the clearing signal was ordered by the viewer, the picture would be unscrambled and the screen would look like this. Zenith started work on the phone vision system in 1931. In 1951, the system was commercially tested with 300 families in Chicago. Further tests followed, and there was some indication that the system was not only technically feasible, but could be made economically feasible. Unfortunately, that hope never materialized, and in 1971, Zenith, for all practical purposes, abandoned the project. Despite such setbacks, Eugene McDonald's strategy brought outstanding success to Zenith throughout the 1960s. But the key to that success was the rapid growth of color television sales. Zenith's new management team of Joe Wright and Sam Kaplan knew that television sales would eventually peak. A decision was therefore made to attempt to diversify, and a few acquisitions were made in such areas as medical technology and watches. None of the acquisitions succeeded, and in the early 1970s, Zenith was suddenly confronted with severe competition from imported television receivers, particularly those from Japan. Normally, this problem would have been handled by Wright and Kaplan, but Kaplan experienced an untimely death, and it became necessary to go outside the company to find a new president. The man chosen for the job was a former Ford Motor Company executive, John Nevin. Upon joining Zenith, Nevin and his fellow executives analyzed the options available to Zenith and finally concluded that their best option was to rededicate the company to the strategy and statement of business purpose which had been sketched out by Eugene McDonald almost half a century earlier. Referring to the Zenith story, Nevin said, quote, in 1971, we concluded that our greatest asset was the reputation that Zenith had earned with American consumers for producing consumer electronics products that were superior in both performance and quality. Therefore, we decided to concentrate our corporate efforts on consumer electronics, realizing that the consumer electronics market would be intensely competitive and that some American firms might not survive." Unquote. That decision was quite a tribute to Commander Eugene McDonald. As a judgment on the historical effectiveness of McDonald's strategy, Nevin's statement is obviously correct. Whether or not Zenith was correct in continuing to define its business purpose in McDonald's terms remains to be seen.